This is a great panel they had with Roy Thomas at Pop Culture Power Show. He has some great stories with Stan Lee and starts off with his work on Star Wars. So you want to hear this. Check it out. And so forth. And, and I, but I never thought in terms of anything. I got off it after a few issues once the thing had been out because once it came out, it was kind of a sacred cow. You know, they said, hey, you can't do anything with Darth Vader. You can't do this. You can't do that. And I said, well, you know, I said, I gotta have something with these next few stories. I can't use Darth Vader. I can't have. Do anything with the romance between Leah and Luke? I didn't know why. I didn't know why. <laughs> <laughs> I was not in on that. I just said no. They said that you can't do Darth Vader. I said, well, there's this thing you mentioned in one place, which says the Clone Wars. I said that sounded kind of interesting in this one sentence. There. I said, can I do something with the Clone Wars? I said, well, no, we may want to do something with that one day. So you can't use that. Well, it took about 20 years to so do a Clone Wars, and they, and they finally did it. It was not too great. But I don't know my comment, but I probably wouldn't have been here. But anyway, the thing was, so I was pretty, pretty frustrated. I said, well, look, the only thing I read, the thing I liked the most about Star Wars, and the thing that made me decide what to do, it was really Han Solo's character. I had, and once I saw a picture of him, Chewbacca, the Wookiee, the whole idea of that, they reminded me of these uh, characters I liked in the old Planet comics and things like that. You know, there was Northwest Smith, who was a pulp magazine character by C.L. Moore. I like that kind of character, you know, the guy with a ray gun, you know, and a partner is like, you know, Lone Ranger and Tonto on another planet almost, you know. And uh, so I said, so I'll just use Han Solo and Chewbacca, and I did a magnificent seven kind of story, and, you know, and everything. And then uh, I got a call from George's right hand man, the guy who had told me about Star Wars, and they said, well, there's one thing, says, uh, you know, we don't like, there's one thing George doesn't like in this uh, comic before he was did it. That you know, seven type story, you know, for seven tens. He's, he doesn't like this green rabbit, thing, you know, Jackson the <laughs> rabbit. I said, well, he's only going to be in for two or three issues, but he's out. He wasn't intended to be a regular character. And uh, but at that point, I just got, you know, I said, this I think I think I'm just going to quit. <laughs> you know, I said, I'll finish the storyline. He says, you know, give it to somebody else. I'm not getting a dime extra for it. All I get is grief. I said, I, you know, it's just, it's just. <laughs> I said, I, don't, I, I liked writing Conan because Robert E. Howard died four years before I was born. So he doesn't give me any lip. You know, the estate just gets, you know, I do the comic, they leave me alone, and they collect the checks. I get my check, they get their check, and everything's fine. But I didn't want to have to say, oh, can I do this, can I do that? I hated that, you know. I had a really good relationship with the literation of the Howard estate, and I had a good enough relationship with George, but I was always going to go hat in hand and, can I do this, can I do that? And, oh, and have him second guess. So I decided I, I quit, and uh, Archie Goodwin took over, did a great job. The funny thing was, about three issues later, he and Walt Simons and the artist put Jackson into another story, The Green Rabbit, and they put him on the cover. The, he had, nobody had put out a memo that said, don't use The Green Rabbit anymore. So, so Archie liked the character, so he did. Then, then George got real and said, don't, I don't ever want to see that Green Rabbit in a comic book again. Well, George is gone now. He's alive. I'm glad, you know, but he's he's gone now. So now they're doing a Jackson uh, special comic, and I'm with a, and I'm really glad to see it. We got our revenge. We got Jackson the Rabbit, and George got Jar Jar Binks. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I think Jackson's better than Jar Jar anyway. Yeah. But anyway, it was it was a, just a fun project. You know, a year a year or two out of my life. <laughs> okay, so I have a last question for you in terms of. When you approached, say, a story that you were going to create, what was your process? How did you go through it? You know, how did you set up the plot? You know, were you going just writing to see where it went, or did you have a meeting you know, and then already set up? Because just to let you know, I, I was school teacher. I teach English. So you said you were a teacher. You had my well. you had my sibling. Oh, I talked about my sibling. <laughs> yeah, we commiserate right here on the stage. But anyway, please. Well, every, actually, there's a thousand different processes. Sometimes something would just come to me. Sometimes I'd have to really, you know, sweat over. If you ever do any creative work, you know that some things come easy, then some things come hard, some things some other body suggests to you, even if you don't remember it or something. You know, you can't always, then somebody says, that was my idea. And, you know, you don't know. You're just having a conversation. Mm -hmm. So it's more like you'd have to know a particular, you know, character. And, uh, you know, uh, the vision, I wanted to do a new character. Uh, I wanted to do a... A, you know, a character in the Avengers brings somebody in. I wanted to bring in the old Vision from the old comics. Stan didn't like that character. But he said, I want, no, I want a new Avenger, but have him be an android. He didn't say why. He just wanted him to be an android. <laughs> didn't care. He trusted me enough. So, okay, you just, okay. So I made, so without telling him, I just made a new Vision character up. 
who looked a lot like the old Vision. I put a diamond on him, which I swiped <laughs> from the old Spy Smasher character in Fawcett Comics. Right. And, uh, you know, he's a little different, but he looked a lot like the old one. Gave, made him his face red because we had a Green Hulk and Blue Atlanteans, and if you made him white, you could see the paper on the other side. You know, oh, I see. So it says that nobody's going to like his character with his red face. I said, I, you know, Martin Goodman told you nobody's going to like a Spider-Man either, but they did. You know. <laughs> and they did like it. So that was, so, uh, you know, so I got my vision and he got his android, and uh, I don't know how happy he was about it, but, you know, eventually, and he never wrote the character, so he was happy enough. It, it became a very popular character. Iron Fist, I went to see a kung fu movie that had a thing in it called the, it was the first one I'd ever seen, and had a thing in it called the Ceremony of the Iron Fist, and I thought that would be a good name, and my selling process, the stand walked in and said, how about if I do a superhero, kung fu hero called uh, Iron Fist? And he said, okay, and that was, that was it. <laughs> then I went off and got Gil Kane, and we designed the character, and so forth, and, and that was it. So, you know, other things were, you know, every character was different, you know, was, uh, you know, uh, Warlock was because I, I liked Jesus Christ Superstar, and I thought, hey, what if we had kind of a Jesus Christ kind of character, but he's the only superhero on the planet, so I came up with this old theory, which I think goes back to medieval times about Counter-Earth, okay. that on the other side, the far side of the sun, by this time, as they knew their, you know, the word Earth was flat and all that, I mean, it was round and all that, but I said, uh, you know, put him on, on Counter-Earth on the other side of the sun, so Gil and I made up this whole... Thing, worked on together, and we stole Captain Marvel's lightning bolt. That was Gil's idea. He says, well, you know, nobody's ever used that again. You know, that character can't be brought back because DC had sued it out. So he, said, so he says, how about we use Captain Marvel's lightning bolt? I said, okay. I should have never let Jim Starlin take that uh, lightning bolt off. In fact, I think it was somebody else after I left. I would, probably wouldn't have let him do it. I was proud of swiping that lightning bolt. You know? And, uh, of course, Starlin took over and turned it into a weirder character. and it became that, That's where it really became hit. Uh, my character was called Warlock, Gil said, well, you know, what? he's going to be the first superhero's planet. Why don't we give him a name? Like Adam. I said, okay, so he became Adam Warlock. He's a superhero with a first name. So I don't know. Every character was, you know, was different. Sometimes it was all me, like the Hyperion and that squadron and Sinister. I actually drew the first pictures. I, I drew the co design, the costume, the coloring for Nighthawk, Hyperion, that version of the Wizard and uh, Dr. Spectrum, you know, and so forth. Others... And a few other characters, Mr. Bones, I drew the first picture of, and, and uh, Union Jack. But mostly, I, at, at Red Wolf, I came pretty close to drawing for, uh, for John Buscema. But uh, usually, I, let, I just told the artist sort of what I wanted, or what do you think? And, you know, some, you know e everything was a collaboration. I worked with, you know, some of the best. I worked with John Buscema and his brother Sal, and Gene Cohen, Barry Smith, Neil Adams, I mean, you know, Gil Kane, you know, you, you can't beat working with talent like that. I didn't get to work with Kirby much or Ditko, but, you know, uh, I got to work with some pretty good, good guys. And, you know, we, some of the teams worked out better than others, but I had a lot of fun with it. You know, Marvel owns all these characters now. At least they give me little, you know, little nickels and dimes from it from time to time when they make a movie or something. So I'm happy. Yeah, you mentioned Neil, and that makes me think about this. Like, your work on the X-Men was phenomenal back in, like, those late 60s. I read some of those stories. They're really, really good. Mm -hmm. uh, but speaking of X-Men, um, you did have some influence on Storm. Is that correct? Whenever Lynn Wayne and Dave yeah. Cockrum put that giant size X-Men together, but yeah. you did have some influence on Storm yeah, I didn't that remember. Too many people Len, don't Len know about. This, yeah, every, well, you know, the thing is that... Uh, well, first, of course, I'd come up with the idea for Wolverine, you know, just, but just that he's a Canadian short guy and mean, and I gave it to Len to write. And, John, and I gave it to John Romita to design the, count, the character. And uh, then I came up with the idea in connection with a couple other, with uh, the president, of the idea he wanted to do a, he said we should do an international group. So I said, well, let's make it the X-Men, you know, because we wanted to bring them back and so forth. So we, we started on, on that. And... I, I, right after I got the X-Men kind of started with a team going on, before, long before it came out, I left being editor-in-chief and just started, you know, writing and editing my own stuff and come, you know, I'd come into the office once in a while. And at some point, when I, I just was, would come in, you know, a couple days a week, I'd come in for an hour or two, I, whenever I wanted to, I had a desk there, but I didn't have to come in. And, and I found that uh, by this time, Len had taken over, decided he was going to write the X-Men which was fine. He was the editor of the Color Comics. That was his privilege. And uh, Dave Cockrum, whom I had appointed to be the artist, was still going to be the artist. And he, the two of them and one or two other people, probably Chris, Chris Claremont, who was his assistant editor at Lens right then, uh, they, um, 
they were just sitting around in the office and they had all these characters were trying to figure out exactly who to have in the thing. And I got no interest in that. That's up to them, you know. I mean, I'm glad Wolverine was in it, you know, and I, I, was, I see Banshee and Sunfire, a couple of other characters I had co-created in it. They were just sitting around and, and I said, hey, what's going on? And I said, well, we're just, we have got this character, it was a character called Typhoon, who's this thing, and then we got this, this black woman character, she's called this and this, and we can't figure out how to get this together and this together. And I don't know, I, I wasn't even thinking, I said, well, you know, I said, why don't you make the black girl, you know, the, the storm or stormy, typhoony character? And he said, oh, that's good. So that was my contribution. You know? But I was just, a, it was a, I didn't even remember it until Len wrote it, you know, said it in some interview later. I just, I was just sticking my head in and getting out as fast as possible. I, you know, I, mean, I was happy to see the X-Men coming back, but I didn't, you know, wasn't really involved. But it was nice of them to remember that I had something to do with it, you know. Have, I haven't got any checks from it, but you know, uh, but they did it. But uh, it's it's nice to be associated, even in the tiniest little way, with a good character like Storm, you know, because she became such a great character. But that was it. Just so, I had to earn that paycheck somehow. You know, they weren't paying me for my looks. Everybody knows that. So, uh, which character and story had the greatest impact on you? Well, if it's a story that had the greatest impact on me, it probably wouldn't be one I wrote. You know? It would be one someone else wrote, I suppose. And I wouldn't really know what that was. I mean, the greatest series that had the impact on me was the Justice Society of America and All-Star Comics from the age of about five. And, uh, you know, and that's influenced my life greatly. I mean, I've done, how many comics did I do? Seven or eight different titles at DC that had some variation, you know, whether it was Infinity that was their kids or... All Star Squadron, and then Young All Stars, and Secret Origins. I, you know, and America versus the Justice Society in the last days. I, I did every human thing you can do with the Justice Society, except an All Star Comics book, which I never did. But uh, so that was. But you know, they all had an impact in different ways. Uh, the characters I liked as a kid, you know, I mean, I liked the Superman, Batman, all of them. But I probably liked Captain Marvel as well as Hawkman. I loved Hawkman for that look. That. When he had the beak and the, yeah. the double beak and the, the wings and Joe Kubert was drawing him, he couldn't get any better than that. But, uh, you know, Captain Marvel was great because it was like Superman was kind of funny and light and uh, much more intelligent stories. Uh, but, you know, I mean, just sometimes if something would be a poor comic and then it would suddenly become good, like there was the Black Terror comic or Fighting Yank, they weren't... The stories weren't that good, but the last few years, Jerry Robinson and Mort Meskin teamed up to do them, and a couple other people, and they were just wonderful, you know, so, and, and they all had an impact on me. One of the strongest impacts, I think, was the day I walked in, right before, so I was looking for fireworks at the age of 15 at the, uh, in my hometown, I walk into this drugstore, you know, look at the comics while I'm uptown, and, uh, and I see this issue of showcase number four staring me with a new version of The Flash, you know, who had been gone for, by that time, for five or six years and so forth. And I never occurred to me The Flash was going to, you know, or any of the other characters would ever come back. What little did I know that day, they'd all be back, you know, and a lot more besides. And the other one, although I didn't realize the time, of course, was the day I walked in and uh, saw Fantastic Four. And because, you know, I'd never bought any of that monster stuff they did. Fing Fang, Foom, Googum, Son of Goom, whatever, Gort, Son of whatever. I never, I, 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 I'd look at it because I knew who Kirby was. I had loved, I'd liked Simon and Kirby's work since I was six, seven years old. But I, I didn't know which was Simon, which was Kirby, or who did what, who held the pencil, or whatever they did. But I never bought any of this stuff. But when I saw the Fantastic Four, it's like, oh, it's a monster, but it's two monsters, in fact, but it's also a superhero. So I, figured that out, so okay, they're trying to do their own Justice League, so I, I bought two comics, which was a, a great decision, except that a few months later, when the price of uh, back usually went up to 50 cents, I sold my spare, and I hear it's worth a little more money now <laughs> you know, than it was. All right, I have an uh, industry, industry question to ask you uh, in terms of working with folks. You mentioned that you work with Mort Weissinger. Mort we yeah, yeah, I, I labored under Mort Weissinger, <laughs> like well, an oppressive weight. He's always been mentioned as being a bear on, you know, on the floor or whatever. You have any interesting Mort Wessinger stories? To How long have we got? <laughs> I only worked for him for about a week or so. It's still, it was no, it's it's strange. He was he, he's a talented guy. He's the co-creator of things like Aquaman, Johnny Quick, Green Arrow, Vigilante, a number of good characters. He was you know bright guy, science fiction fan, science fiction editor at uh, Startling Stories and some of those before he got in. And, Good friend of Julie Schwartz, who you know, who got in the field later. They were buddies as uh, 
what, selling uh, uh, as agenting science fiction stories, things like that. And then uh, more, I, I had never corresponded, I had exchanged exactly one letter with Mort Weiser over this, what was it, Herco? It was some sort of alien, uh, alien monster that fell in love with Lois Lane. And it was drawn by Kurt Schaffenberger, who had drawn all the Captain Marvel, Marvel family stories. So uh, it appealed to me. I wrote him a letter how much I liked that story. That's the only letter I've ever exchanged with him. But he, only, he knew Julie, and I was exchanging letters with Julie Schwartz over Green Lantern and Justice League and Flash all the time. And so he, he just decided to hire me long distance without ever having met me. Suddenly, I, I had just... About a week before, I had accepted a, um, a fellowship because I wanted to get out of high school teaching. Sorry about that, but you know, I, I respect teachers, but I hated doing it. But, I wanted, but I, I wanted to get out, so a friend of mine helped me get this fellowship to go to George Washington University in Washington, D.C. It was in foreign relations. Now, I knew nothing about foreign relations. I mean, a date with Brigitte Bardot was my idea of a foreign relations at that time. But, you know, I'll do anything if I can, you know, I'll go off to school. But, get a job, support myself on the side, you know, certainly didn't have much, any money. And uh, right after this, sometimes a couple of weeks after this happens, I'm, my life has changed in this direction, you know. Before that I wanted to be an Egyptologist, but again, no money to go to school. And uh, so all of a sudden I get this letter from Mort Weiser off, off, off in New York, I'm in St. Louis, and uh, offered me this two-week trial thing, you know, and uh, to be his assistant editor, proofreading, doing letters pages and stuff, and you know, I figured, well, I mean, Julie Schwartz had something to do with it. I think he had talked to Julie and said, oh, yeah, Roy, he's a teacher. I like him, you know, so forth. He's, he's, he's give me a chance. So we made arrangements, but I'm going to get there. He offers me $110 a week, which is not good money, but it was a lot more in 1965, of course, than it is now. But it still, it still was, it's about what I was making as a teacher by that point, but it wasn't going to go as far in New York. But I was going to do it anyway, because while I hadn't been really thinking about getting into comic books, you know, I didn't think it was possible, really. Um, and I never really tried. You know, if somebody just offers me a job in comics, I, I gotta take it. So I put my fellowship sort of in my back pocket in case those two weeks didn't work out. And I go off to New York, tell him when I'm coming. He says, fine, everything like that. Advanced me a few, they got me advanced a few bucks for a ticket. And uh, I show up, he says, well, I can't start paying you until next week. He says, you know, and so I have to, you know, live there, so forth. I said, and, and they says, oh, it's a hundred dollars a week. And I said, well, you said in the letter it was one hundred and ten. And he just looked at me like, and, and this is his exact words, as if it made sense. Is well, I can't pay you any more than I'm paying that idiot down there. The idiot being the guy I was replacing. I said, well, you're, if I'm replacing him, maybe you can pay me an extra ten dollars. Or why am I replacing him? But so all of a sudden, he's lowered the amount of money by around ten percent. He's not going to pay me for, until the second week I'm there, even though he knew when I was coming and he said it was okay. And so, and then he begins, but I start training and everything, and, but he was a brow reader. He was just a sadistic guy, very talented, but very sadistic. He didn't, I don't think he liked being in comic books. A lot of these guys, even Julie, they didn't really like being in comic books. It was a job for them. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but, you know, as a result, I think when, you, when you're in a job you really don't like and you're dealing with other people, so, you know, it's very easy to be kind of, have a kind of a self-loathing in a way. And you pass that on to everybody else by treating them badly. And the worst two at D.C. were Mort Weisinger and Robert Kaniger, another very talented writer-editor who's, uh, I mean, you know, just, a, I, never, I never had much with it, but he was an evil person. But a good writer, you know. Good, they say Michelangelo wasn't much of a dinner. Oh my too. goodness! <laughs> but so more, so fun. But I wanted to meet Stanley. I, I, I was really depressed working for Mort because I, if I missed a, if I missed a, uh, a typo somewhere in a story I was proofreading, he would berate me. If I found something, he said, "Well, you know, when we were in the army in World War II, you know, we called this, we called this." So, so you know, what I found right. Didn't count. What I found, what I missed was was bad. Is this and that, but I was determined to make it. You know, I was determined to make it. So, but I wanted to meet Stan Lee, so I sent him a letter. Uh, I'm in the hotel in say in New York, but I still sent him a letter because I didn't know what to do, to call or whatever. I I had never exchanged much of more than one letter with Stan, but I think I had missed the first. Spider-Man comic with Sandman. Is it four or whatever number you probably but one of those real early ones? And I'd written him a letter asking if I could buy it, and he sent it to me. But that's the only letter we ever exchanged. And he'd read my Fantastic Four review that had come out two weeks after FF number one went on sale. And he mentioned my name in the letter. I thought that was great. Stanley mentioned my name. That's great, you know. But that's close. I'll ever get to that too. So 
He said that, uh, so he called me when I got the letter. He called me at my hotel. I had just gotten in about 5.30 in the afternoon. He call, called me from the Marvel offices. He hadn't left yet. And he said, uh, he says, well, you know, I don't really socialize much with, you know, uh, because, uh, you know, I live out on Long Island and I got to, you know, go home. But, you know, we got a, kind of a writer's test, kind of looking for writers or something. You know, so, you know, we want to come take it or something. And so I, so I said, well, you know, it's hard to resist. Somebody offered you to take a test. You know, why not? I wasn't thinking about taking a job. I had a job, and so well, the DC was a company I'd sort of wanted. Marvel was much smaller at the time. It was, you know, a, a fraction, you know, 20, 30 percent, 40 percent of the size of DC, and uh, much smaller company, and you know, much more. So there was more money at DC even to make you think eventually, uh, everything. And you know, I was already assistant editor to Superman, the, the biggest thing at the company. So you think, you know, but you know, can't resist. So I go up there and I sneak off at my lunch hour. You know, and I uh, take, and I, secretary comes out, Stan doesn't come out, so I still don't meet Stan. Gives me this writer's test, which was really four pages of Fantastic Four art, black and white art with the balloons taken out. And I was supposed to write dialogue. I wouldn't prove I could plot, just would prove I So I said, well, I take it home. So I write it overnight in my little hotel room with my little Smith Perona electric portable. And I Sneak it up the next day. This time the, pr the, pr the uh, production manager, Saul Bradsky, also a long time comic book artist, came out and he took it. So I still don't meet Stan. Well, so, okay, so I go back. Next day I get a call in the morning from Flo, the Flo Steinberg, fabulous Flo Steinberg, the secretary, with her high pitched voice that I recognized immediately and asking if I could come uh, see Stan, you know, Stan on my lunch hour. So I sneak up a third time, you know, and uh, I met, I met Stan, you know, and everybody else I started off trying to call Mr. Weisinger, this is that until they invited me to do something. So Stan, it had to be, hi Stan, you know, he had persona in the comics, you know, made me feel I should do that. So anyway, about 15, 20 minutes after we uh, met, he offered me a job. He said, uh, what do we have to do to hire you away from National? It was the exact word. National being DC's real name at that time. And I said, well, I said, I'm very unhappy there. I said, just, just offer me the same $110 a week. I'd have done it for 100 I think. But uh, the same $110 a week, I said, I'll, uh, you know, I'll give him my notice. I said, I, I, that's, it's as simple as that. He said, okay. He says, you said, but I got to give him two weeks notice at least, you know, because I won't leave him in the lurch. And uh, so I go back. I'm a little late, about a half an hour late by the time Stan and I talked. I didn't try to get out of there real fast. So I, so I just figured I'd tell him I trip on the sidewalk or something. I don't, they didn't ask. So Ward calls me in after I get back. I'm half hour later for he's going to chew me out. But I guess the people had told him, you know, they didn't think that I was going to take the abuse from him that the previous guy, Nelson Bridwell, had taken for a year or two. And uh, so he starts trying to be a little nicer. I, mean, I don't know, just, you know, different things and so forth. And, and that's why I waited. I said, well, it's very nice. Where I said, well, I have to tell you, it's kind of academic. And I said, but I, I want to tell you right away that I... Uh, I've accepted a job from Stan Lee, and so this I'm sort of giving you, you know, two weeks or more notice, whatever you need, you know, uh, to. Uh, I think you should get to keep Nelson. I think he's better than you think he is. But I said, you know, I, I won't leave you in the lurch. You know, I'll, I'll stay here as long. He says, he looked at me and glared. Says, you're a spy for Stan Lee. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> so hey, that's those are his exact words. So I, five minutes later, I'm gone. You know, I go back. Stan's delighted to see me. Gives me a Millie the Model story to write over the weekend. He was modeling the Millie number 44. I signed one or two here today. And so I doubled my uh, pay, uh, you know, that week by writing the, the, by dialoguing this Millie the Model story over the weekend. And, you know, went on from there. And so I have to thank Mark Weisinger for two things. One was for offering me a job and bringing me to New York because I was not adventurous enough to have gone to New York looking for a job if I'd even thought of it. And the other thing is, for being such a, that I didn't, that I didn't feel guilty about quitting him. Because otherwise, you know, if Stan had offered me a job and I'd liked my other job, I'd have felt kind of a loyalty to the guy who brought me there. I, my, I, I'd have had trouble. But since he was so nasty, you know, it made it possible to quit. So, you know, he helped me out twice that way. Anyway, there's, there's other little, but I didn't have much time to get too many more wise of your story. We never spoke again. You know? I saw him once, somebody's funeral a few months later, not his, but... But uh, uh, across the room, and he glared at me, and that was it. And a, few, a couple of years later, he retired and unfortunately died soon afterward. I'm sorry we never got a chance to kiss and make up, but, or, or make up anyway. And, uh, and he was a wonderfully talented guy, but boy, one of the meanest. Oh, my goodness, this is a funny one.
And that's all one, my first two weeks in New York. <laughs> Probably All right, so right now we're going to open up to, yeah. the, to you guys if you have any questions for Roy. Um, yeah, I'll make the answers brief so we can get through a couple. So, and this is just something I've always been curious about because I've always felt like um, Bill Everett. Yeah, one Bill the, Everett. One of the artists that has the unique distinction of before he, before he passed away, his work got better. And he was like, in my opinion, those last few Submariner issues were amazing. So I was just wondering, what kind of person was he like? Well, when I, did, when I met him, he was mostly an alcoholic, but a really nice guy. Yeah. No, I, I was there in, uh, I was sitting there in the office around the turn of 66, sometime around there, been there a few months, sitting at my little corrugated tin desk with my big typewriter uh, trying to do some work and uh, proofreading, whatever. And suddenly I, I look up and I see this tall, thin guy, about, you know, in his 40s, over, over there, a little emaciated looking from the years of smoking and hard living. And uh, Saul Brassi, the production manager, say, this is uh, Bill Everett, you know, and so forth. And uh, uh, I, I see him say, oh, I know you, the creator of the Submariner. I mean, I had been a fan of Bill's. I liked his work in the late 40s and in the 50s. My feeling is his best work was in the 50s when he did the Submariner there. But he did some nice work at the end there, too, when he created Namorita and did some of that stuff. And uh, he said, Saul said, uh, well, Bill's looking for a place to, uh, he lives in Connecticut, I think, or Massachusetts, living, and he needs a place to stay, you know, three or four nights a week. Well, my friend Gary Friedrich and I, the guy who co-created Ghost Rider, we'd been friends since high school, he, he and I had just moved into an apartment in Greenwich Village, and uh, while it didn't have a lot of room <laughs> in it, uh, we said, well, you know, Bill could kind of, you know, crash on the couch or whatever a few nights a week, and I didn't clear this with my with, with Gary, but I was paying most of the rent at that time while he was looking for work, so, uh, you know, so I just kind of pushed Bill in. Well, you know, Bill and Gary got together, and Gary offered Bill a drink, and they were best buddies forever, and I was like, <laughs> Bill, Bill was wonderful. He was pretty undependable because of the drinking and things uh, in those days. He would, I remember once he'd come in with a, a, a story, there was a Western story, a half-breed, I think it was a character or something like that, and, he was supposed to draw it and said, uh, ah, you know, it's all destroyed by my dog or something. It didn't eat it. It just spilled ink on it. I, so I was feeling a mischievous boy. So Bill, I said, just bring in the page and, you know, and, uh, you know, the, we'll, we'll look at the art and then I'll be able to pay for that page anyway. And he says, oh, no, the, the sink spilled all over. You can't see a thing, you know, black, all black. So I said, okay, Bill. But uh, eventually he, uh, he joined AA. Uh, in the last few years of his life, and uh, you know, he, he was a real proselytizer and a big, you know, major guy. And he was really a nice guy. We had a lot of, you know, fights, and he, he, uh, he, we were roommates off and on at another place of mine later on. And he, he'd walk in and, you know, be staggered around and leave handprints on the wall with the ink and everything. But I, I loved Bill Everett and so forth. And he unfortunately, he seemed like very old when he died, but he was really only about 53, 54 years old. And, uh, it, you know, I mean, I, I wish he'd gone on, you know, forever. He was just, you know, just, just a wonderful person. And The Submariner, I think, is one of the great creations of the comic books, uh, visually and, and the whole idea. Except those tr swimming trunks in the 40s were doing nothing, but the ones later with the, you know, that, that kind of look, that was pretty good. But I don't know, but he, was, he was even a good writer. You know, I know Gil Kane was always saying he was, felt he was one of the best writers in the 40s comics with Submariner and with that amazing man character he had done earlier. And Venus, he did some good Venus stories. He was just really good. Hi, um, what was your reaction, and did you enjoy the interpretation when you found out they were using your guys for the Star Girl TV show? Oh, yeah, I mean, they were so different from what uh, yeah. my wife Dan and I and Jerry Ordway and Mike Macklin in Durious Combination had done for Infinity. But, you know, it was, it was interesting to see, though. I was kind of pleased that they, you know, gave us credit and a little money here for doing it, but I mean, the, the, the characters were mostly pretty different. Mr. Bones was a little closer, even without the costume, and, uh, you know, I was glad to see Jade, but I wanted to see her green, you know, and everything, because she should be green. Were you shocked that they used those? Yeah, I, I, it, it, they just kept, it seemed like every year they were coming out, even the ones they killed off, like Brainwave Jr., they had them in there a little while, and Icicle, and, you know, it was, it was very nice of, uh, um, you know, it was a nice way to do it. I'm, Please, I don't know Jeff Johns very well and so forth. You know, I know he had been doing the All-Star comics. It was, it was very interesting to see, you know. Uh, it's not a series I would have watched if my own characters weren't on it, you know, and so forth. But, uh, you know, um, you know, but 
it was, it, was, it was very pleasing to see what they did with it, but of course they never got around to having Infinity Incorporated, which was just all these characters, but still, it was nice to see, uh, you know, I mean, I felt a little guilty, because obviously I didn't create our man, he was created in like 1940, 41, but, you know, I made up the son, and he's the one that's on there now, and so forth, and, you know, and it, they're sort of partly mine, and they're, you know, partly the TV thing, and so forth, and... Uh, but somehow Jeff Johns got his name on the series three different places. My name's and, <laughs> and the other and my collaborator Jerry Ardway. None of us ever get mentioned. We but we do get we do get little checks here or there. So it's it's nice. I, I wish it were going on you know longer. But they had three seasons. That isn't bad. Uh, I loved your run of the Avengers. Like, that's what the comic I grew up on. But I had a question. It's kind of for you and also I guess Stan Lee. The original four people that were in, well, I mean, they kind of, it was Thor, Iron Man, Captain America, yeah. and Giant Man. And then in, in issue 16, yes. they stripped those right. characters. And then, like, through the beginning, when you took over the book, you, it seemed like you were trying to add back the Yeah, characters. they had even maybe take out Captain America, you know, why, for a while. Why, yeah. What was his rationale there? Or well, it was... It was basically continuity in a way. He was getting letters from the older readers, especially saying, how can Thor be doing this to the Avengers when he's on a quest, you know, and so forth. I never worried about that kind of stuff. But still, if you're trying to make the characters more realistic, as he was, than DC is, you know, you think about that. So he decided the simplest way was just to write them out of the Avengers. Captain America didn't really have that much of a life. You know, some of those stories were in, in, that he did, his solo stories were still being, what, World War II retreads and things like that. But then later, it just kept, I don't know, he made me take out Captain America because he then had his own magazine. And, you know, and uh, I kept saying, well, you know, even you had Captain America. You took out all the geared characters. I can't, you know, I said, I got Goliath, who's not as good a character, and Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch. They were good characters. They're good supporting characters. But, so I kept bringing them back in for an issue or two. I'd sneak them back in. He'd make me take them out again after an issue or two. <laughs> and, and finally he got a, you know, as the, as the time got on by the, the late 60s or so, he kind of gave up on it. And then I could just use whoever I wanted to, you know, and so forth. He didn't mind. He just, you know, he figured, ah, you know, they'll, they'll straighten things out and kids will figure it out, you know, and so forth. So, but it was all based on the idea of continuity. So what gave you the idea or the light bulb to bring in... Coded into Marvel, and how did Stan take it? Well, it was Stan's idea as much as mine. Uh, actually, it was the readers. The readers were writing a lot of stuff and saying, not necessarily Conan, although that was part of it. it and they didn't even say create a character. They said, why don't you get one of these characters from the paperback? You know, there was Conan. There was also Call. There was Brack the Barbarian by John Jakes. There was Elric of Belnibene. There were two or three others. Gardner Fox had a Kothar. Two or three other imitations of Conan. We didn't think we'd get Conan because that was the top character. We were trying to get Thongor, another character, but, our, but his agent kept holding out for more money, even though the a writer himself, Lynn Carter, liked the idea of having a Thongor comic. Stan liked that name Thongor better than you know, Conan. So that's about it. So I said, okay, we're going to try to get... But luckily, again, luck, you know, like with Star Wars, we didn't get Thongor because his agent kept hoping that he would, that we would up the money. Well, I knew Martin Goodman, the publisher, we weren't going to up the money. We were lucky to pay anything. And uh, so one day uh, uh, I, I picked up the latest Conan because I was buying. By that time I was reading them and enjoying them. But earlier I really had just kind of just looked for the covers by Frazetta. But then I read them and I said, this guy really knows how to write. This, this is really good stuff. And I, it just took me a while to realize it. And I saw the introduction. It said, it mentioned the name of the literary agent of the Robert E. Howard estate, a guy named Glenn Lord living in Pasadena, Texas, who gave his address. I didn't need a house to follow me. If you want the rights to code and you write to the guy who's the literary agent for the Robert E. Howard estate. And he said, okay. And he, you know, I said, well, we haven't got much money to pay you, but we, you know, we can, uh, uh, you know, might make the character more popular, which it did, and uh, so forth, so why not? You know, and, he, and I got a letter back, said, okay, you know, and uh, that was it. And uh, we didn't have the right originally to do any of the stories. You know, we couldn't, but I, I sort of negotiated that later, so that by issue three or four or five, we were, we were able to do that too. That was sort of an extra that I kind of pushed on my own. And I somehow got Marvel to pay a little extra money for it, so otherwise I'd had to pay it myself. And uh, so it just became, it, it took off, the first issue sold really well, or, you know, pretty well. The next seven issues, each one sold less well than the one before, until with the uh, issue number seven, which was a really nice story about that man-headed snake, 
uh, based on a, a Howard story. It, uh, actually, the magazine was canceled for one day. Stan wanted to cancel it because he wanted Barry Smith to draw superhero comics. He knew Barry might resist being taken off Conan. So he figured, well, that book's going nowhere. If I kill it, then he'll do it. I, I talked, I said, if you want to take Barry off the book, take him off the book, and we'll get something else. But I said, you know, don't kill the book just to get Barry Smith off. I said, just take him off. He said, you know. So anyway, I got it put back on. And the next issue picked up in sales, and, and Stan saved it too, besides everything else, because we were having all these animals. We had a giant spider. A woman turns into a tiger. You know, there's a giant bat. And Stan said, you got too many damn animals in these covers. I said, the kids want to see, you know, he said the kids, he knew it was college kids as well as, you know, he says, they want to see, you know, humanoid things. So the next cover, we had a choice for number eight between two things. They were, they were uh, a bunch of eight foot, seven, eight foot skeletal warriors in armor, or there was a giant monster that uh, Barry drew to look like a Gila monster. We could have drawn either one. Since Stan wanted humanoid, we drew them. The book sold better. The next issue, we had a bat-winged guy, and that sold better. From then on, it was it, for the next like 25, 30 years. It was you know, you know, fairly good seller. It finally, kind of petered out. But uh, you know, so Stan was as, as responsible as I was for the uh, the fact that we had a book at all, and he was responsible for saving it. So I mean, it's kind of funny because Stan could never even stand to read that stuff. Uh, he said, he "says I don't understand this sword and sorcery. You're doing it. I don't know." He says, "Sometime when you got an issue and you think it's okay, tell me it, and I'll read one." So when issue number four, Tower of the Elephant adaptation, came in, um, it was a copy of everything but the cover. And I said, "I said, well, this is a good issue. Well, try reading this one." Stan went off his office, comes back about five minutes later, plops it down on my desk, says, "Well." I guess it's all right. It's not my thing. And he just walked off. <laughs> that's that's the, guy's the closest comment I ever had to stand about coding, you know. Oh, yeah, there was one more. I got to tell you one. Was, and Roy, that issue became the number one story of the year that year, too. Yeah, you won award. But the other thing is, when well, we did Savage Tales, you know how beautiful that adaptation of Savage Tales was at Barry Drew. When the first one was done, Savage Tales number two, we well, you know it's a quiet meeting because we're adapting the story and it was a nice splash page. But then Valeria comes in, she's on a horse, she dismounts, she stands around, she's there a page or two looking around, Conan comes up, they, they talk, he's going to attack her or something like that and so forth before they get attacked. Two or three pages, but it's mostly just standing around talking, she's riding the horse. Stan looks at this, it's all ready to go out now, so it's not time. He says, what is this stuff? She's just riding the horse and standing around, they're not doing anything, they're not fighting anything. He says, well, that's the story, you know. He says, well, it's a crappy story. So, 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 but we got to say that. So when the sales figures came back for Savage Tales 2, and they were you know, pretty good at the beginning, I go in and I said, Stan, look, I said, this book, you said, you said nobody would like it, but the sales, the sales figures are pretty good. He says, well, you had a good story. It had been even better. You know, so I can't argue. <laughs> I can't argue with that, so I just let it go. And, you, know, you know, he just let me alone. He never read Conan. He never gave me. Those are the only two conversations I ever had with Stan about Conan. And that was it, you know, Conan was mine and Spider-Man was here, we each had our thing, you know. Anyway, thank you very much for uh, yeah, yeah. a little round of applause. Thank you. Roll Thomas, Legend Thomas.